Welcome to Co-Opinions. This is Indie Thoughts, the segment where we have independent studios on to talk about their process. Today, I have Ali Hakansen from Image Inform on. There we go. Fantastic. Hey. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Ali. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Trust me. Um, <laughs> quick question. Just want to make sure I get this right. It's Ola Hakansen? Uh, Ola Hakansen. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very Swedish name. It's don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll I'll do my best. I promise. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so, anyways, how are you doing today? I'm good. Yeah. No, so, I don't know if you had a chance to check out the podcast at all. It's a very small podcast. Um, I have not actually, but that's fine. I will after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a busy individual. I fully understand. Um, so I was hoping today we could talk about both your involvement in Image and Form and also um, the process that you guys go through for the various games you've had, because you've been on since near the beginning. Um, I know that you helped to design the Steam World Tower Defense game, which is the only one I actually haven't played, and it's also been said to be hard enough. You're the only one who's beaten it. I think we actually heard of someone who beat it the other day like on twitter or something but yeah it's not i mean we that was kind of a devious move by us we basically just made it so hard that no one would notice how short it was you know like <laughs> like nintendo i was about to say like the old school nintendo tactic yeah, right there yeah, that was pretty much it yeah it's uh, and we even like reuse the maps uh, so we just play through them twice uh, <laughs> It's not a great game. You don't have to play it, trust me. <laughs> well, it's on DSYware, isn't it? I think it'd be kind of yeah, hard right. for me to get right. it. It's not, it's not too easy getting it, though, this is, yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, so. I think that I still have my old DS somewhere, but I'd really have to dig that out. So Yeah, yeah. I'm not even sure if DSYware is open still. Uh, That's a valid point. But yeah. anyways, <laughs> uh, when did you get involved with Image and Form? Were you around when they were still making edutainment games, or did you come in during Ant Hill? Yes, uh, so uh, I um, got in, it's nine years ago, uh, in November, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've done one of those games, uh, edutainment games. Um, but yeah, basically the... Uh, my origin story was that <laughs> uh, that um, uh, I was hired to do a DS port of, for one of those um, um, uh, children's games we were making. And the day after I started at Image Form, uh, the project was cancelled. So, yeah, uh, that's harsh. But, um, uh, but uh, my boss, he took picked it on me and actually uh, we got uh, uh, DS kits and made uh, let me make a project anyway. So that's that's <laughs> Steel Tower Defense, basically. Yeah. All right. And is that is Steam World Tower Defense, when you guys thought that up, it's obviously tied into the rest of the Steam World series. Did you guys have an idea of how fleshed out you wanted to make this world when you created that first tower defense game? Yeah. Uh, so I, the idea from the start was to um, create not only a game, but a game series like a uh, what's it called yeah i can't remember this uh, english word for it but a franchise i guess uh, but um, um and the, the idea was to make something that we could just make game after game but we don't have to stick with the same genre or like same game series because they get stale after a while and so on and uh, i had done a couple of games before that and uh, i kind of wanted like this flexibility to make something that's uh, uh, more varied uh, as you've seen with uh, steel dig and heist uh, yeah. absolutely now do you think that you would go back to like maybe make a steam world tower defense 2 since now you guys have significantly more notoriety, I would imagine, than when you put out the first Steam World heist, uh, Steam World yes. Tower Defense. I mean, I would absolutely love to make another Steam World Tower Defense. I would. I'm just not very sure anyone would buy it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, you do see uh, Tower Defense games uh, uh, pop up in the same charts sometimes, like uh, Bloons TD, if you know it, on, uh, on uh, uh, iOS. And um, yeah, but I think the genre is a bit stale, maybe. But yeah, uh, 
I would absolutely love it myself personally because I just love the uh, uh, tower defense games. I was curious if that was something that you were working on on your own because I tried to do a lot of research prior to recording this, and I saw on your Twitter feed in early in mid 2017 you were working on games in your free time, and the picture you had was a tower defense game. So I thought maybe there was a chance that you'd already started doing this, and it wasn't j just something nobody knew yet. Sure. So it's uh, that's my home project. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, not only us. Uh, I mean, I'm going to ramble on with this for hours oh. probably if you don't stop me. So please stop me. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, it's a um, it's a tower defense maker game, kinda uh, more like. Um, um, Mario Maker. So the, the whole idea is uh, um, basically like for people who has played uh, um, uh, a lot of custom games on the Warcraft 3 and Starcraft 2 uh, and Starcraft of course, uh, like mm -hmm. custom games there, um, you've seen like entire genres spawn from those uh, uh, from those level editors like Tower mm -hmm. Defense and MOBAs and so on and uh, the idea is to um, basically make a game that is about that so it's a incredibly over uh, ambitious project that yeah i've been working on for years and uh, still going on actually it sounds like a lot of moving parts in that oh yeah <laughs> yeah it is so. not entirely serious like <laughs> I, I yeah like mm. well the screenshots i saw had drafts moving through it oh, yeah. so i figured <laughs> that you know not not super grim dark as it were so no. Yeah, I, I'm not a, much of an artist. I kind of hope that people will make <laughs> their own bottles that are better uh, than that, but we'll see. We'll see. But <laughs> coming back around to your work at Image and Form, yes. uh, how much... Um, so you've obviously been in since uh, SteamWorld Tower Defense. Now, <laughs> for SteamWorld Dig, um, that was actually where I first came into the series. That was the first game I actually ever beat on PS4. <laughs> um was that something that I know when SteamWorld Dig 2 came out, um, one of the things that they said was SteamWorld Dig got all these amazing reviews, but you guys were kind of actually disappointed because there was so much more you wanted to put in. Was that a constraint of, I know your team is less than 20 people, is that still the case? Uh, we're, I think we're 24 now, but okay. yeah, after and Dig we expanded from like, Maybe, maybe we're nine or ten or something, and we expanded to twenty uh, over like a year or two. Um, so the question was if we were constrained by time for uh, well, like. Uh, so I have a modicum of project management background myself, mm -hmm. um, and it's important to set those different milestones so that way scope creep doesn't take up all your budget and all your time and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Did you find that you were setting certain date milestones or certain content milestones to make sure you develop the game at a certain point? I'm curious what the process was that made you decide, okay, we're happy with this product, and if we make a SteamWorld Dig 2, here's everything we'll put in. Yeah, so the process was more of... Uh, realizing that we were running out of money and uh, gotcha. yeah that much uh, the, the reasoning between uh, behind the uh, all our games included like up until heist at least for d2 we probably could have gone on for a bit more but uh, still it has to make sense like the amount of uh, time and money you put into a project um, so so basically as that we we didn't really have i mean we did make a profit from our earlier games like Antil and so on, but it wasn't until Dig we actually had like, um, yeah, the ability to fail with a product, so to speak, like we, we didn't have re really, uh, so we just had to keep it very lean and simple uh, back then. So with Dig, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, uh, go ahead, yes. So with Dig, was it something where you guys... Was there a distinct point where you found that that game had succeeded? Because I know that it was highlighted on the PlayStation Store for me, and between the visuals and the gameplay style, I'm a huge fan of platformers and roguelikes. I'm like, this looks right up my alley. Mm -hmm. And 
because you know we're all we're all working individuals. I'm like, hmm. how long is this game though? Oh, it's about eight hours. I can handle eight hours. These hmm. sixty hour games, I don't really have the time for anymore. Hmm. Hmm. So, where was the point where you thought that you saw that this game had succeeded? Well, I guess it's just when we saw the first couple of days of uh, sales. You can pretty much tell from that, uh, uh, more or less. Uh, uh, how it will do, uh, and so on. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't take too long to know if it's a flop or if it's a success. I mean, we do have ports that can go better or worse and so on, but I mean, they rarely go uh, beyond the original uh, first release. So that kind of sets a cap on the, uh, the amount of sales we can expect from the remaining. Hmm. Well, I know SteamWorld did... SteamWorld did, correct me if I'm wrong, it came out first on the 3DS, correct? SteamWorld, yes, it did. Okay. <laughs> and I would imagine, because especially with the accessibility, I, I don't design games, so correct me if I'm wrong here, um, <laughs> you run SteamWorld Dig on a homemade engine, correct? Yes. So that makes it fairly easy to port to other systems, I would imagine? Yes and no, I guess. I mean, uh, it made it possible for us because you... Um, you couldn't use, I'm not sure if Unity was even a thing back then or like um, uh, multi-platform uh, engines like that, mm -hmm. but you you couldn't uh, use Unity to make 3DS games and you still can't, you can only make uh, them for the, what's it called, new 3D, 3DS. Mm. So, uh, so it's not really an option to use a game engine if you want to have multi, uh, not the big ones at least, uh, if you want um, uh, to be able to port it. So, yeah, but I mean, it is a lot of work to do, uh, like the origi uh, original uh, work for a port, uh, mm -hmm. like getting all the pieces together that uh, that's needed for the engine. So, um, yeah, that, that still is a, like a constraint for us that we, like new platforms come out and we, like it takes a lot of, like a couple of months at least to make uh, a reasonable port for that, so. Well, and because you say it that way, I'm actually curious, um... Because I know SteamWorld Heist Complete Edition somewhat recently released on the Switch. What mm -hmm. drives the decision as a studio if you want to make the port? Now, the Switch has been wildly successful, so I imagine that played in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can say. I mean, uh, our SteamWorld League 2 sales on uh, the Switch were just phenomenal. That's uh, where I, I mean, got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, so basically, it's that. It's just it's it sells well. It's that easy. Um, I mean, we do some releases that um, I wouldn't say that it's a guaranteed like runaway success to, if we release it on this and that platform. But we still do it sometimes mm -hmm. because it's yeah, it's uh, for example, doing the port for Steel League Two to a 3DS was very hard technically, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and it was more of just yeah. Uh, Keeping it like uh, making our fans happy, but basically because uh, yeah, the costs kind of uh, get up to the level of the profits, expected profits by that. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, mm -hmm. uh, one last question about Steam World Dig was: mm -hmm. Did you guys what inspired the idea of you only have so much time to go down and get the different ores and then come back? The reason I ask is because. Some people said it was inspired by a game called Motherload, and mm. I thought that those games came out at about the same time, so mm. I didn't think you guys would have been inspired by it, but I was curious. Yes. Uh, actually, the my main inspiration was a game called Mind Reading Deep. Uh, it was on the Xbox Live Indie Games uh, mm. uh, lineup. Uh, I thought that game was fantastic for what it was, like a super simple one-man uh, game. Uh, I think it cost like $10 or something, and uh, I played it for much longer time than I thought I would. <laughs> and basically, just uh, I discussed it with, uh, with my brother. Uh, we uh, both work here, uh, to mention form. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, just we decided that we should make something out of this, and we tried it at home first, and then realized that this is a big, bigger project than we could do, then we mm -hmm. brought it here. Gotcha. So, and Motherload has, uh, I think there was actually a web browser version of Motherload, uh, uh, I think so, or something equal, like similar to it anyway. 
uh, that uh, that we played uh, a little bit as well. But uh, Mind Reading Deep is definitely a main um, inspiration. All right. Uh, hmm? Now, if you don't mind, if there's nothing else you'd like to add about SteamWorld Dig, I'd like to move on to SteamWorld Heist, if you're okay sure. with that. Fantastic. That's fine. So, with SteamWorld Heist, that was an enormous jump in everything. Like, you change mm. the way the character models looked, you change the gameplay style, you change the setting significantly. Now, I saw for the gameplay style, um, I believe I actually read a Rock Paper Shotgun um, article that talked about how you guys had sat down, and you were talking about XCOM, and the changes mm. XCOM had made, and that made you go, we kind of want to do something similar to that. So can you mm. give me some insight as to the process behind the gameplay uh, for SteamWorld mm. Heist? Mm. Sure. So SteamWorld Heist, that's, uh, um, as you read yourself, uh, it's originated from just, uh, we were playing XCOM, I think it was the first expansion to the first game at the time, and we thought it was just brilliant as a game, and we're just discussing it at uh, the lunch table. It's one of those kind of magical moments that doesn't happen too often in game development, but sometimes that like everyone was involved, and we just uh, uh, started to talk, like, we want to make a game like this. Like, wouldn't it be cool if... And uh, I think it's, from my point of view, uh, I was a bit bothered by the random... Uh, um, number generation, like the, the whole uh, point at an enemy and you have 85% uh, or 95% chance to hit and it just feels silly when you have a shotgun to a face and uh, you miss, <laughs> like, and it's, uh, you can uh, deal with that somehow uh, sometimes, but sometimes you lose a mm -hmm. kind of mission or a character for that. And we wanted something that's a bit more, um, I don't know, less, uh, like less uh, random, basically. And we thought of this whole, uh, like, aiming free, uh, free aiming uh, in 2D. Uh, I don't think that would work in 3D or uh, anything else. So I think it's, uh, uh, it was, yeah, it felt just, um, felt like a very good uh, match for us to make mm -hmm. a 2D game with, uh, with that. And, I mean, the idea was from the beginning to make um, games in different genres and so on to keep it not to go stale and so on, so this was pretty much perfect. I mean, at the time, uh, we were actually working on two games by, back then, uh, prototypes for games. Mm -hmm. uh, none of them panned out. Uh, like, um, yeah, basically we made prototypes and they, they, they weren't fun. And we, uh, we still do uh, prototypes and <laughs> lots of prototypes and they often aren't. So, so it's a good way to um, just reduce costs and so on. Uh, uh, but yeah, so we did the same for Heist, made a little uh, uh, prototype of it, and uh, it was actually Steam will dig with just uh, the same graphics and everything from Steam will dig. But yeah, it was pretty cute, and I'm sure we have it somewhere. Uh, but uh, it actually managed to convince ourselves that this will be a, um, a fun project to, to make, and uh, uh, it makes sense. Now, <clears throat> I know a buddy of mine, SteamWorld Heist is hands down his favorite game he's ever played. I think he's played through it a half dozen times, if not more. That's great. What? Oh, he loves it to death. In fact, when I told him I'd be having you guys on, he's like, ask him when a SteamWorld Heist 2 is coming out. <laughs> I'm like, buddy, I don't, I think that they'll tell us when they're ready. But yeah. <laughs> have you found a lot of people who have had similar, like they, this game just hit the sweet spot for them? Like, there's so many unique things about it, like the fact that defeating people isn't what gets you XP, it's the fact that actually collecting the loot gets you XP. Mm. Um, the fact that there's the risk-reward versus the precision shooting to take off people's hats, which mm. also plays into people's desire to get hats, yep. which, I won't lie to you, I got the achievement for getting all of the hats. So. <laughs> That's which amazing. In, which includes the unicorn combo, which killed me. That <laughs> took forever. Yeah. We so. do feel a bit sorry about some of those achievements, actually. Like, in, in retrospect, Jesus Christ, what have we put people through to get these, like, the it, collectors? Uh, yeah. It's funny, actually. <laughs> Speaking of what you put people through, um, there's an achievement for getting everybody up to level 20. Mm. And I didn't understand how the new game plus worked. 
So I had everybody up to 20 except for, I think, the Billy, his name was. He was, like, level 18. And I'm like, okay, I'll just start the game over so that way I can get him some easy levels. And I started the game over, and everybody's levels reset and auto-saved. And I'm like, I have eight hours gone. I hadn't saved or backed it up. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no, oh, no. I'll just make a little note here to not make it that way in the next game. <laughs> Well, it was so funny because my buddy who played, it's like, are you, you really didn't see that it resets everything but your hats? I'm like, I, I no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's casual, actually a funny thing because I don't think we have that many or even any achievement hunter type of players in the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, we might now actually, when now that we're more people, but mm-hmm. uh, so, so we kind of just try to get that right you know but it's kind of hard when you you can't get the feel for it yourself uh, uh. i will say the hardest ones and this is don't get me wrong i know who this is for but it's the get all gold stars on the hardest difficulty yep. i looked at that and i'm like ooh, i don't i don't think i'm that good no, it's... but i about to say i'd imagine you designed that personally so probably like i <laughs> i absolutely love playing Playing high stand uh, uh, and so on in uh, like in just higher difficult levels, you, mm-hmm. so you just have to care about everything you do. Um, it's the same in XCOM and so on, uh, but the difference is I'm not really that good at those games. But mm, that's <laughs> so going into Steam World Heist. Did you know you wanted to make DLC, or was it something you decided after the game had already come out? can't actually remember if we i think we actually started out trying to like see if dlc fits into this model mm-hmm. uh, we actually had a much more comprehensive uh, dlc because we have a, uh, we released that uh, the outsider dlc right that's most the biggest one and uh, the hat packs uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah we had a much bigger DLC planned, like uh, an extra episode uh, with new faction of enemies and tons and tons of stuff uh, uh, planned in there. But then we took a look at it and uh, uh, decided this is just too much. Like we can't really take that risk uh, because uh, uh, compared to Dig, which like, yeah, it was fantastic the sales from it. Uh, uh, Heist, it took twice the time we uh, Hope, had hoped it would <laughs> to finish, which is uh, yeah, that's that's kind of awful. That was uh, a pretty hard couple of years, <laughs> mm. and uh, yeah, and uh, just um, I can't remember the initial sales for it. I don't think they were fantastic. I mean, it has gone up uh, like quite well mm-hmm. uh, sales. Uh, so, uh, but I think with that in mind, we didn't want to risk a too big DLC, and so uh, so we made a smaller one. Did now, that answer your question? I can't you, <laughs> you did answer my question. Oh, it's because um, there are some games, like the one that jumps to mind immediately, and you might not have played it, there's a game called Asura's Wrath. Mm, Any, no. The big thing about that one is that <laughs> it gated the true ending behind a DLC. Oh. And, yeah, that was a bad time for everybody <laughs> involved. Because mm. it added a third, uh, not a third, an extra quarter onto the game and added some <laughs> really amazing content. But a lot of people were angry because you had you already bought the game and then you had to buy the ending. So yeah. when you're talking about a DLC of that size, because the game SteamWorld Heist launched at $20, I think? I think so, yeah. Okay. A mm-hmm. DLC of that size would probably cost at least ten, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah. So, I'd say so, as an individual who, again, I don't make games, I work project <laughs> management somewhere. Um, <laughs> I would imagine there's a price point. People look at DLC and they go, "I'm not a hundred percent sure whether or not this is worth the time investment." And I've never had to do the analytics on that. Mm. So I know with the Outsider that gave you. Three missions, a new character, and some additional things. Correct me if I'm wrong. I can't remember how many missions, but three sounds uh, too few. I think it was more than that. But okay. Yeah, I remember yeah. there was one in every area, because <clears throat> if you would have played the game 
having the DLC, it would have been a really organic kind of thing to be like, oh, here's something for Finn in the first area, here's mm. something for Finn in the second, here's something in the third. But I bought the DLC well after I'd beaten the game, so I'm like, one, two, three, dead. And don't get me wrong, it was still really good, and mm. it introduced a character in a really organic way, mm. which that was something I was curious about. Because it's very obvious, it, well, semi-obvious in that one, that he is an offshoot of the antagonistic force from the first game. Hmm. And as we go into Dig 2, he's, an, he's a main character. Admittedly, he's much differently portrayed in that one. Hmm. But yeah, uh... Yeah, Fen has changed a lot between uh, those games and so on, and we have uh, uh, more ideas to fill in the gaps and so on, uh, of course. But yeah, there's uh, th it was uh, the plan from the beginning to have this character like tie the world together a bit more mm -hmm. uh, and to have Fen. Um, it's a bit unfortunate in a, in a way uh, that we um, did Fen in a DLC uh, editor or him. Uh, not sure we've decided on a gender yet, uh, if any. Uh, but um, uh, just, uh, yeah, that it's basically you have to pay for the DLC to get this character. That's that's a complaint we've gotten, and uh, I feel a bit bad about that, but that was our only way to like get it to fit together and make sense with the whole world. Uh, and so on to make all that new content needed to like anchor uh, uh, in, this, uh, in the highest universe and so on. Sorry, you didn't really have a question here. I just ramble on. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. This is the kind of insight I was hoping for. Like, okay, this, great, is, great. this is great. Yeah, okay. Another quick question about Heist. Who approached who about the music for that game? Because Steam Powered Giraffe does a fantastic job of setting up a lot of the ambience. Mm. Um, one of the things that I still think about when I think of SteamWorld Heist was any time you beat a boss and one mm. of their songs starts up. Oh, so yeah. did you approach them, or did they go, hey, guys, we love your stuff. We'd like to make music for you. So as I remember it, we approached them, but, yeah, I would say don't quote me on that. <laughs> but <laughs> obviously you will. But uh, I, I I think we approached them, actually, that, uh, that it was that way. But... Um, yeah, I guess you would have to. The, the thing is, uh, by then we were uh, more people at the office, as I said, and uh, I had kind of moved out, um, like uh, more specialized my own uh, things that I worked on. So I don't didn't really do too much uh, contact with uh, like audio people and other, uh, uh, yeah, side things like that. So I can't actually remember who did that uh, did that work, but I guess you would have to ask them. Do you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll see. I'll just ring them up. You know, yeah. got their direct line. <laughs> awesome. It was it was a bummer for me though that I'm a huge fan of supporting independent studios such as yourself in various ways that I can, and the number one way I like doing that mm. is picking up the vinyl OSTs of mm. the various games. Mm. And the Steam World Dig One and Two have beautiful OSTs. I like the translucent vinyl. I also like the art on them. The music, of course, is fantastic. But I was bummed to see that the uh, physical pressing for the heist um, OST was done through Steam Powered Giraffe because that sold out years ago. And mm. if I want to get a copy of that, it's like $140 on Discogs. Uh, I, right. I don't think I can do that, but... No. <laughs> yeah. I guess you would have to ask them again, since they have the direct number for, for a re uh, like release of those uh, albums and so on. Mm. But I have to uh, get back to the thing you said earlier, mm -hmm. uh, with the whole, uh, like, uh, just this uh, moment when we got uh, the Queen uh, mm -hmm. song after you defeat the second boss yes. in, uh, in the uh, second world. I thought that was one of the best moments in the whole game when we got that into place. I absolutely loved it and starting that. Like it's, it's it, fantastic. It's funny because actually I'd heard everybody online when they talked about this game, they always talked about the Red Queen and how difficult she was. And there was a fantastic build up to her. The introduction of her second in command, who's that crack shot who can hit you just about anywhere. <laughs> and fighting all of them as you're fighting her. That was a great fight. 
And <laughs> when the song started up after I beat her, I actually thought the game was over. Like, that's oh. how climactic it felt. I'm like, right. okay. This. And I went on to Twitter. I'm like, this was another great game by Image and Form. And then I go to the next area. I'm like, never mind, there's more. Take <laughs> So, yeah, I know. guess that's a bad thing, though, that you don't have this expectation of uh, where you should be, like the uh, climax level and so on. Well, you guys actually nailed it because <laughs> you'd built up everything to that point. I really thought that the big reveal, and it was very obviously meant to build up this way, was they were going to have humans in containment. <laughs> and then when you get in there, it's actually the bad guy from the first game. I'm like, I did not see this coming at all. <laughs> So you guys nailed that one. So, and the uh, and summarily the next area where you fought all the electricity-based enemies who were significantly harder than the parts in the first two. It was really good pacing because I felt like the challenge scaled really well with as the characters were continuing to level on. So, do you? How much of your Q&A do you outsource? How much of your play testing is done by people external to the company? Because I'm curious about the feedback you got for this. Hmm. Um, so uh, our Q&A is still pretty, uh, pretty simplistic. We don't really have an external company that we use or anything. Um, I think we might any day now, but we, we haven't so far. Uh, so we basically just bring in uh, friends uh, and uh, have them test it. And uh, yeah, we've actually gotten that kind of down to a science, how we do the tests and so on, because we have done, yes, yeah, so, so many of them uh, by now. Uh, and uh, we try to get people who are like more hardcore, less hardcore, like different uh, levels of uh, yeah, gaming experience and different ages and uh, genders and everything. Yes, just try to mix it up as much as possible to get uh, like a... Uh, uh, maybe I mean the game games we make will like all games will, won't uh, be suitable for everyone or like uh, appealed uh, appealing to everyone I guess but um, at least we learn a lot by having especially like lower end players lower at that sounded bad but like <laughs> <laughs> low quality you, players uh, <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it's but, people who don't play these kind of games yeah, often exactly, I mean exactly. you're trying to be accessible that's why you have a difficulty slider right. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we've had, had like trying more and more to get that, uh, get better at that, like uh, make it more accessible to more people and so on. And we still fail in a number of different ways, but it, it is we get better at it every game, I think. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, quite happy about that. <laughs> do you find and do you find a lot of people asking for a Steam World Heist too? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I won't I won't ask you about it. Since you obviously are keeping it at the forefront, I just know that anybody I know who's played these games just keeps saying, I'm waiting for them to confirm the second Steam World heist. Hmm. So I'm personally curious, especially, and as we get toward the end, I'll talk about this more, hmm. with Steam World Dig 2, um, since you went back before heist, I'm curious if in Steam World Dig 2 you introduce characters who will then be important in a theoretical Steam World heist too, because in Steam World Dig Two we saw a lot more of the uh, shiners or whatever mm. you call people in that world. Mm. So I'm curious. I, I don't remember the exact amount of time between Dig Two and Heist, but I'm curious if the characters that you introduced in Dig Two will have an impact on the world moving forward. My guess would be yes, because they blew up the planet, but. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, it should be obvious to anyone like, who has played both games, Dig 2 and Heist, that uh, uh, like, we've just tied together the series by that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that uh, where uh, a potential Heist 2 would uh, be placed in that time scale is not really, like, I'm not sure exactly where we would put it. I mean, it could be before the events of Dig 2 or even Dig 1 or... And so on. So, uh, so it kind of depends. And also in um, in Steam World, I think we have decided that robots actually do get old and die. Uh, like, mm. um, yeah, like um, Dorfis' dad uh, died in between Dig One and Dig Two. Mm. Uh, just uh, basically go uh, grow old and die off as anyone else. So, I 
I mean, if if a heist two would take place after heist one, they there wouldn't be anyone alive uh, uh, from back then. Uh, because oh, it's, uh, Yeah, it's a uh, it's a long time. But who knows? Maybe they have uh, <laughs> found some way of uh, like surviving longer. Like there was a bunch of people in tubes in the first heist. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. So and lots of magical Vectron tech. So yeah. <laughs> lots of that. Speaking yeah. of which, that's as good of a transition into Dig Two as anything. Mm-hmm. So going into Dig Two, you guys did a lot of fantastic misdirection. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much of that was intentional. I think that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong. One thing you guys seemed to do was you got really you. Somebody said, oh, there's going to be a Steam World RPG. And you guys just kind of latched onto it because it meant that everybody was going the wrong way mm-hmm. while mm-hmm. you were prepping the Dig 2 trailer. Mm-hmm. So I know in some of the lead up to the announcement, because it was during one of the Nintendo Directs at the very tail end when they were talking about Switch, they're like, oh, and here's an announcement. Boom, Dig 2. Mm-hmm. And prior to that, you guys had been saying, oh, we're going to show something new. Here's a hint, here's a that. And mm-hmm. somehow people got, they're going to make a Steam World RPG. Mm-hmm. How much, do you have any insight as to the lead up to that? Um, I think I have to be boring out here and say the short answer is no. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, marketing is, uh, yeah, we, we actually have a couple of guys who do, do that uh, full time and I can't even remember this uh, this particular event like uh, exactly when uh, how we did the, the release and so on um yeah so so yeah that's probably my short answer <laughs> the reason it jumped out to me so much was because there was a fan created rusty amiibo in the background of your guys teaser of guess what's coming next right. and everybody goes oh, amiibo you guys are going to do a steam world amiibo um, and i i am an unabashed shameless collector of those uh, so the second they're like steam world amiibo so i'm like is it on best buy is it on amazon no it doesn't <laughs> exist <laughs> oh man yeah i think steam world amiibo is something that we all want uh and uh yeah i pretty sure we don't have anything in the pipe but i guess we would announce that if uh, it came out uh again i think it's more the marketing we have uh, i'm not sure if you talked to julius our marketing guy uh, i did not who does most of, okay yeah but he's uh, the the guy who knows all all of these things uh better i just make the games he sells them <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm not sure how many people are in this boat, but if you guys did it Shovel Knight style and released three Amiibos for one of each of your games, I would buy that in a heartbeat. I would. I have my credit card out already for that, just <laughs> awesome. throwing that out there. <laughs> yep. So, going into Dig 2, this was, would you call this an ambitious project for you guys? Actually, I think it was one of the more sane projects we made. Uh, like, uh, Heist was definitely an ambitious, mm-hmm. like, crazy, probably, uh, project. Uh, while Dig 2, just making a sequel for the first time, that was pretty interesting for us. And we, um, um, I mean, we had a pretty good plan how to make this game from the very beginning. Like, uh, basically, the shape of the world and uh, uh, wanted more Metroidvania, less random generation. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, all of that stuff and more characters and more um yeah a better more tidy in store and everything and uh, uh yeah it was for our mr standards uh, it was a pretty smooth production all in all i mean we did uh, exceed our budget by i'm not sure how much but uh, we, we we never really stuff in time but <laughs> but yeah but mm, quite happy with the whole production uh, uh all in all I did notice in Dig 2, and maybe it's because I beat Dig so thoroughly, but in Dig 2, it did feel a lot more exploration-focused because in the first Dig, I felt that I was definitely coming back up to the surface consistently. Like, it Mm -hmm. felt more like, as to say earlier, the mother load type thing where I was definitely on a timer. It felt very organic in the Dig 2. Did you get a lot of feedback similar to that, or is that just a me thing? Mm. So basically, that the game was. Mm. Can you rephrase that question? I'm not sure if no. I understood it. Uh. So in Dig, it felt like every time I went down into the mines, I definitely mm. had a time limit, which makes sense because mm. you have your decreasing lantern. With sure. Dig mm. 2, you still had that, but I mm. felt like the exploration had been fleshed out enough 
that mm. I felt more like I was really getting into the exploration and that I don't, it felt like you'd refine the mechanics a lot between the sure. first dig and second dig. Did you get yeah. a lot of feedback? Did you work yeah. really hard on refining that? So We did work really hard on refining that, like just getting the whole, um, instead of being more like a flash game kind of uh, setup or like the original uh, um, uh, minor dig deep. Mm -hmm. which is very like just uh, bounce up and down and so on uh, we wanted this more um yeah we basically wanted to make the player want to explore the world that was mm -hmm. uh, very much a goal from the beginning and just to have uh, more fun stuff to find and so on um and everything was tweaked uh, uh to um yeah to get that to happen basically and uh, um one of those things was just that light uh, uh like the light aura in the game uh, basically didn't really have in much effect in this game like mm -hmm. less so than uh, dig one especially i think we dropped the ball actually the ball a bit on the whole uh, that whole thing we could have done more with that mechanic i think or cut it out entirely but um yeah uh, yeah so this so yeah it, it was uh, an effort to make the game more um exploratory like that and that's really i guess you put it better than i could it didn't feel like the light had nearly the effect it did in the first game because i would run the light much further down or i would be down in the mine when the light was decreased significantly more in the first game it basically hobbled you you couldn't <laughs> see anything when that light went out so did you get feedback about people preferring um the light having less of an effect because I actually I liked it a lot. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think we, most comments were from uh, our developer peers who kind of thought it was a bit like, why did you have it at all? Like it, it, this didn't really feel. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we've had too many players commenting on it. Uh, can't remember that anyway. But uh, and I agree that it kind of doesn't fill too much of a purpose uh, in D2. I definitely would wa want to make either more of it or remove it entirely in a dig three. Uh, that uh, makes sense to me, at least. <laughs> so what I'm hearing here is dig three is confirmed. Oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> dig three has not been confirmed. <laughs> That's fine. You just... I'll be you very clear. <laughs> okay. I, I have to give you a hard time about it. Oh, I understand. Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So with... <laughs> You mentioned incentivizing exploration. Now, we talked about in the second game how you felt bad about how the way you did the achievements for the hats and etc. It felt like um, you put those in there because you didn't really have a lot of achievement hunters, so you weren't 100% sure how to format it. Did you get more tweaking for the collectibles in Dig 2? Because I thought that you incentivized that fantastically mm. by having each area, each area specifically had a percentage amount, and then the collectibles were often tied to challenge rooms, which were entirely optional, mm. but gave you benefits. And I think the benefits cut out after about 60 to 70 percent of the collectibles had been done, and after that it was just working toward a challenge room. Mm. So what drove that decision? Because that actually caused me to really go out and do everything with the way you had segmented all the collection percentages. Hmm. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so, yeah, basically, since we don't really have, uh, I mean, I'm sure one or two would identify at the office as a collector hunter um, or like achievement hunter. Um, mm -hmm. So so it's very hard to like get the balance exactly right for something when you don't really feel it yourself. Uh, I mean, these games are very much driven by just, we just play them again and again and test no people until it just um, works as well as possible. Mm -hmm. And in Dig 2, it was much closer to, um, to um, I mean, personally for my tastes, it's uh, it's pretty much perfect because I, I, I think it's, uh, for me, it makes so much more sense to get a reward that is more tangible as uh, in uh, Dig 2 with the, like the Hell Caves, as we call them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't beat those, by the way. Oh, no. I tried. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. They're, they're <laughs> named like that for a reason. So, uh, um, I think a lot of the inspiration for that came from um, 
uh, some of the Castlevania games. Mm. I think it was Order of Ecclesia or something that uh, had something similar to that, and I absolutely loved that in that game. Uh, I thought it was just fantastic to get, uh, like, you were so uh, high-powered uh, in the end of those games, and you want a like, matching challenge, and it's pretty fun to, to see something like that. And just a tangible uh, reward like that is so much more interesting to me personally. Uh, and uh, uh, collecting everything, it is fun in itself as well. But I think I need something more like this for it to, to work for me. And uh, that was pretty much the, the, the plan from the beginning to, uh, to, to make it like that. So we did have a completely different plan for achievements at first, but that was a really bad one, and yeah, <laughs> we changed it to this, uh, this after a while. <laughs> well, having played it on the Switch, I only have the in-game achievements they have, which um, we actually recorded a whole episode on why I'm anti-achievement nowadays, because I think it drives the game in a weird way. So I like these in-game achievements, because it doesn't feel like the system is shaming me for not finishing it, but you as a developer are incentivizing me as a player to get it on my own without saying, oh, look how much you are compared to everybody else. So the way you guys are doing it is a way that I find to be really engaging because but, it does a lot more to reward the player than lord it over other people, which I think is good design. Hmm. Now, that being said, I did have one... I did have one outstanding moment from Dig 2, and I'm sure you guys have gotten this feedback a fair bit. About mm -hmm. halfway through the game, Ben goes, if you want to find out where Rusty is, I think this is what happens, you have to go into this Vectron simulation thing. I'm like, mm -hmm. this game has been all bright and sunny. How bad could this be? <laughs> I didn't expect to get scared pantsless at that point. I'm like, if you see an enemy, just run. What are you saying here, buddy? And then when it falls down and these things five times your size start chasing you and it starts glitching out as a whole bunch of them are jumping behind you, that was terrifying. <laughs> Whose decision was that? Was that you or? Yeah, pretty much it was me. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I can take uh, at least for the whole idea with uh, I pushed through the most most of the things with Vectron. Uh, I, I'm so glad to hear that it worked because oh. I, had, uh, I was... Uh, <laughs> It was a pretty hard time actually to get it through internal in the office uh, to, to get it uh, to work because it was so much work actually for such a short segment of, uh, of the game. Uh, I put in, I, mean, I can't really say how much time, but it was a lot of work. But also, like with the fantastic animations from our art director and from uh, like uh, everybody involved, it just nailed it. And the music was fantastic as well. Ooh. It's the only place in the game where we actually switch music. I think it's like five times or something to like when you come come into the graveyard with full with those Vectron bots and so on. We change this hard pulse uh, music yeah. and everything. Oh. I, and you're nailing it because as you get out and Dorothy's just laying on the ground and Finn is like, "Hey, wake up! Hey, yeah. I'm just sitting at my sitting on my couch like, like I'm I'm feeling what they're feeling. I'm like, I I don't want to move. I don't want to get up right now. So that was stunningly effective. Not to brown nose too much here. <laughs> I appreciate a little bit of brown nose, I guess. <laughs> No, so, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm generally happy to hear that. Uh, we've gotten lots of positive feedback if, about the whole thing, and uh, now I really want to make a horror game, but yeah. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, prior to that segment, if somebody said the Image Inform guys were wanting to make a horror game, I'd be like, everything of theirs is so colorful and happy. I can't see that. That <laughs> one segment alone, I can 100% <laughs> see it now. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, good yeah. job for sneaking in a demo. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean the whole the whole idea is very much from uh, uh, from the ghost ship segment of Super Metroid. If you played, like yes. that. yeah. So the ghost ship there, it scared the crap out of me as a kid, and uh, I, I thought it was just fantastic the whole setup and like setting and the music and everything, or lack of music, I think in uh, that case. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I just felt that that was uh, a fantastic moment in, in the game to like switch the pace and get something new out of it because i think that was one of the main things we screwed up with steel heist that um especially the first world but also the uh, the remaining ones are kind of samey 
and we did see quite a lot of like a big drop off by players. Uh, like they didn't even finish the first world, which wow. is a shame because the second and third are much better. Um, uh, arguably, I guess, but to me at least, it's like that. And we just uh, this is uh, pretty much uh, a reaction to to that that it just felt like we needed to mix up the game a bit. Uh, uh, well, and then I hope we get uh, like time and uh, ideas to make that in future games as well. So SteamWorld Dig 2 doesn't strike me as a game that lends itself to DLC, and you guys haven't announced anything. So is it my understanding that SteamWorld T Dig 2 was released as the entire package? Like, I would imagine there's not going to be additional content for it. Uh, I mean, you should never say never, but I think the chances are very, very low by, the, by now. Like, we've, we've seen by far the, the peak of the sales, and uh, I'm not sure if a DLC kind of... I mean, most of all, I don't think it really makes sense in the way that it does in in uh, SteamWorld, uh, like in Heist. Uh, you can't let really it tie it in uh, as well. It would have to be like a little side story, like after the. And I, I'm not saying never, but very, very low chances of that happening. So yeah, I, I would imagine with Dig Two, especially the way it ended, to implement a DLC, you would have to create like another side area. And it would have to have some kind of self-contained story like you had, and it wouldn't have to. It'd have to feel like it wasn't shoehorned in. And mm. Dig Two felt like a complete package. It included the challenge area. It had a ton of collectibles. It had a good self-contained story. I feel like a side thing like that would almost detract from what you guys mm. have created because you streamlined the process in a really good way. To have a little offshoot would be distracting. Agreed. Yeah, that's that's great analysis, and that's practically uh, more or less where we stand. Yeah. So a couple last things as we come into the tail end of this. Um, you guys recently partnered with Zoink Games to create yep. Thunderful? Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, Thunderful is like the parent right. publishing company right now that uh, owns a bit of both companies and so on. So we're in the, sitting in the same office uh, mm -hmm. as uh, the Zoinksters right now. Do, do you guys have any plans, and you don't need to give me the specifics, I understand, mm -hmm. um, plans for a collaborative effort? Because when you announced creating the parent company, you said you'd still be releasing games independently. But if you needed to contribute resources to each other, you could see that happening. Has there been any discussion of that in the next two to three years? Not as far as I know. I mean, there's been kind of like just talking ideas and so on, but not really any uh, serious discussion about it mm -hmm. as far as I know. But on the other hand, I mean, I work mostly in image form, like taking, uh, making games there and so on. And uh, this is more like wonderful territory. It's gotcha. more uh, they were, who would uh, talk about uh, uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it could make sense, maybe. It's kind of interesting because our, our, I'm not sure if you've played any of the Sun games. I love them myself. Uh, I've been but, meaning to get it to Flipping Death because yeah. that's been getting fantastic reviews. I didn't play mm. Stick It to the Man, which was mm. the other popular one. Yeah. But Flipping Death, I've been meaning to mm. get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, play tested a bit for Flipping Death and so on. But um, I think that's um, uh, that would be pretty cool to make something like Usar because they have a very much more like story driven. Uh, uh, approach to their games, I would call it. Not sure if mm -hmm. they would call it them, that themselves, but uh, in my view, and we are have a very like hardcore game mechanic. Uh, I mean, yeah. So uh, just see what would come out of out of the uh, uh, like a combined project like that. But for now, I think most of our cooperation is more like uh, play testing. It's very useful to have uh, like 20 plus more uh, developers in uh, the same uh, office as yourself uh, who can jump in at a moment's notice and test your game and so on and give you good feedback and everything. Um, so I think that's uh, most of it. And of course, like the board game nights and so on, like things like that. It's fantastic. <laughs> we have this thing called uh, uh, Fight Club, uh, which is... <laughs> Basically, just uh, we have this uh, to call 
yeah, basically a, a Taekwondo club room that we hire and just do our own things. We don't actually fight too much, but it's more like... I about to say, I thought rule one was you don't talk about Yeah, I um, missed that part, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did announce the will be free earlier in this. There we go. Well. So yeah, so apparently I can't really be trusted with these things. Yeah, well, I mean, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> My question I would have had at this point is, what do you see as far as um, you said you have a little over twenty people, and normally I would ask if you could see yourself adding additional personnel, so that way you could kind of cycle game development, like have multiple teams working on multiple projects, so you could stagger your releases more. But I kind of wonder if you were sort of doing that when you partnered with Zoink. Was that something that was thought of? Um, I don't think so. I'm not sure exactly what was the. Uh, the reasoning behind, uh, like corporation wise, wise to, uh, so to speak, with uh, the development parts. But uh, I mean, the whole thing with staggered releases and so on, that's an excellent question because that's kind of been the curse of Image and Form that we've always been a very like make one game and then when it's done and we're lying down on the floor panting, uh, we start scratching our heads a bit and thinking of the next game, basically. And uh, we've just now started into a process which is more like smaller uh, development teams and uh, so on but it's still internally in image and form um, so actually i started today with uh, a, a project uh, that is uh, going to be awesome mm. uh, but uh, yeah basically doing the pre-production and so on and the pitching and all of that so so yeah it's fun times actually all but, right sounds yeah. very interesting um yep. Last question I have for you is that mm -hmm. all of your games so far have definitely tied into a main world. Um, actually, I take that back. Having not played Steam World Tower Defense, I don't know if that ties in. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have what could be considered an end state in mind for this, or do you just think you could keep generating stories and keep making games off of this world indefinitely? I mean, I'll be honest, we pretty much make up stuff as we go okay. with, uh, with <laughs> I mean we, we do get better at least at trying to tie together things and so on but we kind of create the situation that makes the most uh, sense for the game so I'm sorry if that's the, <laughs> the boring answer but that's the truth uh, so, uh, so uh, but we try at least to make it coherent and to, to keep our own rules that we set up for the world and for the like uh, how everything works and so on um, until we need to break them of course it's so useful, by the way, to have Vectron, uh, like you, you see them coming back as the uh, main villains mm -hmm. again and again, because we don't really have magic in uh, Steam World. Like there's only these Steam driven machines and so on. And it's so freaking useful to have magic. Uh, like you can just teleport in things. You can't do that with Steam driven te technology. Right. And it's so much easier to design like enemies and situations and stuff that makes sense when you have a uh, little bit of that, like flexibility. Um, so. That's an interesting constraint. <laughs> it makes for interesting design, that's for sure. Yep. But anyways, I think, is there anything else you would like to add? Not really. I mean, thanks for this fantastic interview. It's uh, the first I've done in this uh, in this forum, so oh. it was um, pretty great for me. Uh, yeah, usually we have people who take care of this. <laughs> things, so, oh, no. So it's pretty cool to do it myself. I really, really like this kind of involvement because I'm really curious about the game design. I'm curious what goes into it, the thought process, etc. So <laughs> I'm supremely grateful that you could give me an hour of your time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you tremendously for coming on. I really yep. appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> All right. You have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Have you played Image and Forms games? Did you enjoy SteamWorld Dig? Did you like SteamWorld Heist in the DLC? Did Dig 2 make you excited for a theoretical Dig 3? Question mark? Let us know, but until next time. My name is Josh, and this has been Indie Thoughts on Co-Opinions.